All right, so now I think we're officially live. Yep, we are okay. live. All right, sounds good. Uh, thanks all uh, who have been waiting in the audience. Um, so we're back with another episode of PyTorch Community Voices. Uh, so this is a weekly webinar where we get to showcase uh, members of our PyTorch community, and they get to come on and talk about how they're using PyTorch and what they're building. Um, and so I am uh, one of your hosts today. I'm Jessica Lin. I'm a developer advocate here at Facebook, focusing on our open source AI ML products and Suraj. Yeah, hey everyone, my name is Suraj. I am a developer at uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook AI. I work closely with PyTorch. Um, you might remember us from the previous episodes. Nice. Um, and today we have with us a special guest, uh, Kashif Rasul. He is the creator of uh, PyTorch TS, which is a PyTorch based probabilistic time series uh, forecasting framework. Um, that comes with state-of-the-art univariate and multivariate models. And he's actually also the co-founder of Fashion MNIST, um, a data set which has become a popular uh, data set for just a number of fashion, uh, scientific benchmarks um, that has kind of built upon the original uh, MNIST data, handwritten data set. So we're really excited to have him uh, come on to be able to talk about uh, these two very uh, impactful projects. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna bring Kashif onto the screen. Hi. Hey, welcome, Kashif. Hi, nice to see you, Suraj. Nice to see you, Jessica. Nice. Uh, could you give us a quick introduction about yourself? Uh, sure, yeah. I'm uh, Kashif. I work uh, for Zalando here in Berlin, in Germany. I'm a mathematician uh, working in the AI research lab, um, uh, working in time series forecasting and looking at uh, exploring deep learning based kind of techniques for some of the problems at uh, Zalando, which is a, a big e-commerce uh, platform. Um, what else? Yeah, uh, I'm also on GitHub and uh, um, contribute a lot to open source. Previously worked in, uh, in uh, the geospatial uh, space as well, a little bit. And, um, and yeah, Thanks, living Kasha. in Berlin. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, the format of the show we usually follow is we'll start with your presentation for about mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes. And during your presentation, the audience will have a chance to come up with questions, you know, right. burning queries that they have about time series forecasting and deep learning, and also right. PyTorch TS. Um, they will be posting their questions on the comments. And uh, we'll have a chance to uh, get to them once your presentation is done. And uh, yeah, does that sound good to you? Awesome, yeah. Um, we can... All right, right uh, so... Um, Put your presentation yes. up and we'll step back. On the fourth awesome. Yeah, so as, uh, as you heard, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, PyTorch TS, which is a, a probabilistic uh, Time, uh, deep learning based time series framework um, that uh, we've uh, developed uh, at uh, Zalando. Um, so um, before I start, uh, you can imagine time series forecasting is uh, quite a fundamental business and scientific problem uh, as it enables uh, decision making and, and uh, planning tasks. And uh, classical time series methods like ARIMA and uh, exponential smoothing uh, um, models are ubiquitous and, and provide robust forecasts that are typically trained on each time series um, individually. Uh, deep learning based um, methods uh, using uh, recurrent neural networks like uh, LSTM are starting to become popular due to their end-to-end -end, um, training of a, a single global shared model uh, and um, uh, and, and they provide all the kind of hallmarks of uh, deep learning, uh, you know, everything from feature, uh, automatic feature engineering uh, to adding exogenous covariates and so forth. And the output of these uh, forecasts can either be point forecasts, um, uh, some point, uh, point values, or they can be probability distributions, in which case uh, these forecasts typically come with the uncertainty bounds. Uh, speaking of uh, probabilistic forecasts, the problem of modeling uncertainty in time series is of vital importance for assessing how much you trust the predictions for downstream tasks, such as anomaly detection or 
our um, business uh, decision um, uh, making, uh, which is what uh, the typically uh, it's what we use these forecasts for right, in the end. Without probabilistic uh, modeling, the importance of the forecast in region of uh, low noise, where you have a small variance around the mean value, versus a scenario where you have high noise, cannot be distinguished. And in the deep learning setting, the two approaches to uncertainty estimation have been either to model the data uh, distribution explicitly, or to use uh, Bayesian neural networks. Uh, and, and they are actually PyTorch-based uh, frameworks for for doing that, uh, libraries like Pyro, for example. Uh, in, in the framework uh, we have, we'll concentrate more on modeling the, the actual data distribution. So it's quite natural to ask uh, what the difference, uh, what, what is the difference uh, of um, neural forecasting versus um, uh, sequential modeling? Um, it's true that neural forecasting takes a lot of inspiration from sequence modeling. Uh, for example, from uh, techniques in NLP. However, there are some key differences here, which uh, uh, time series uh, models need to take into account. The biggest difference is the fact that these sequences uh, in time series da data are not um, tokens, but rather uh, numerical va values. And these numerical values can have uh, arbitrary uh, size as well, uh, numerical size as well. Uh, secondly, uh, the time series are more than just a sequence uh, array of numbers. They have some real world component, a time component, which might or might not uh, contain some signal for the prediction task. And the model needs to somehow learn such patterns, uh, which are known as uh, seasona seasonalities. Thirdly, time series uh, data comes with, uh, typically comes with exogenous covariates, which might or might not uh, belong to the actual data set. Um, an obvious example here is, uh, uh, say, holidays that uh, have occurred and will occur in the future uh, at certain uh, points uh, in time and, and their effects. So even if such data is not in, in your data set, you can uh, use it externally uh, with these models if you think uh, uh, these um, holidays, for example, have an effect. Uh, finally, uh, in the multivariate uh, setting, uh, the ordering of the entities in a multivariate vector uh, uh, at any time point is arbitrary and typically fixed by the data creation process. Um, unlike, say, in images where you know the pixels have a certain ordering, you, you can't just uh, jumble around the pixels uh, in an image. Um, um, whereas in the times in the multivariate time series setting, uh, this vector of values is uh, more or less. Uh, arbitrary and 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 so uh, time series frameworks need to take into account all aspects of uh, of, uh, of of these uh, differences when uh, when doing sequential modeling and that's what uh, essentially time, these time series frame, frameworks do uh, they kind of uh, handle all these intricacies so pytorch ts uh, as i said is our probabilistic time series modeling framework focusing on deep learning based models it's built on PyTorch uh, and comes with the um, um, univariate and multivariate time series models. And more importantly, it uses Amazon's amazing Gluon TS uh, forecasting library for all the heavy lifting, all those intricacies that I talked about. Uh, for example, for loading and iterating over time series data sets, for transformations of the time series data, uh, for back testing and evaluation metrics. Uh, uh, whose whose output then eventually can be uh, uh, put into some uh, paper and so forth, um, as well as all different utilities for creating uh, different time and holiday features as well. Yeah. So with it, uh, you can build your own time series model in PyTorch relatively quickly. Uh, you can experiment uh, and compare pre-built models on uh, existing open uh, data sets as well. So it's quite handy. Um, uh, typically, once you uh, uh, the learning curve for PyTorch CS is a little bit steep, uh, the first thing you uh, will have to take into account is the fact that uh, what the data set uh, uh, that these models ingest, what it looks like. Uh, so the data sets are provided in some sense, uh, open data sets are provided out of the box. Uh, and um, uh, they have uh, their uh, they have uh, three main um, uh, kind of uh, their collection with uh, their they're, uh, you know, they're, 
like a, a hash with three main uh, components. The first is the train component, which is uh, iterator of the training data. Uh, there's also a test compo uh, component. Uh, and um, each entry in, in, in these components are the actual time series of your data set. Um, uh, finally, there's also a metadata, uh, which contains information of, uh, about the time series, in particular, the frequency of the time series here. Uh, in this example, this time series is, say, hourly. And some other uh, just numerical, um, like cardinality, which means that in this data set, there's 414 uh, individual time series as well, and uh, other associated features as well. And finally, there's also a prediction lab, which is the kind of the, the task, uh, which is uh, somehow time series dependent. It's how much that uh, how many time steps into the future uh, we we need to predict for this uh, particular data set. So as I said, that the main we have two uh, data sets: the train and the test. And the main difference between the two for each time series is that the train data set ends at a particular point. So this is an example of uh, a single data set within uh, a single time series within this data set, whereas the test data set has then additional um, additional data, additional ground truth uh, within the test period as well. Um, and then uh, this window is the actual recommended prediction length as well for this uh, problem. And the main way, uh, the main technique for training these models is uh, is to then take uh, somehow, and it takes inspiration from sequence to sequence model, is to take uh, uh, random, uh, in some sense, random uh, windows within the this year training data um, uh, of uh, some a particular context length and a prediction length, and. Uh, uh, and by taking these random windows uh, within uh, a time series and, and then within a random time series of your data set uh, inside the training window, inside the complete training window, you create batches. And uh, this is a relatively complex transformation. However, um, uh, Gluon TS comes with uh, uh, this uh, transformation kind of built in. So in particular, this instance splitter uh, transformation is what's used to create these windows for training. It selects uh, training instances by slicing the target, uh, the, the actual values of the time series, as well as any corresponding features like the time features at random points in the training mode. Or uh, at inference mode, it uh, samples the last context window up till where the prediction, uh, where, up till where the training window ends, and then we can do more predictions uh, that way as well. So um, it's a really handy, uh, handy transformation, uh, allowing you to automatically um, uh, not worry about it. And so then, um, um, once you have this transformation, your model uh, just gets uh, batches of these windows, and and can, and needs to just work with uh, work with those, right? So in terms of what the data then looks like, well, in the univariate setting, uh, a typical batch uh, has some time uh, time component, uh, some uh, some number of time steps, and uh, and a single target value. Then the instance splitter also adds, uh, as I said, uh, time features uh, uh, and other co covariates that may may belong in your data set, uh, and that again, uh, that corresponding window has some uh, uh, feature. Uh, feature size here denoted by f, right? And then, uh, for example, an RNN-based model could then work with these batches and and not worry about the underlying data processing and feature creation that's going on. One thing to note in um, PyTorch is the fact that uh, by default uh, RNNs uh, are um, time. Uh, I have a convention which is like time. The time axis is the first axis, then the batch, then the feature. So in, uh, in order to um, to use uh, the, the data coming out of uh, PyTorch GS transformations, you just need to make sure that you configure your RNNs to be uh, batch first uh, manually. Right. Uh, so uh, let me then demonstrate the process of training a model uh, and to produce a forecast and then uh, do back testing. And uh, the simplest model. Uh, uh, is uh, in uh, is just a simple feed forward model, 
uh, where we um, define uh, the prediction length as well uh, um, a context window, as I said, um, of our choosing. And uh, the, the most important thing is we also define the distribution class that we want for our uh, for this model. In particular, I want for, uh, for this model uh, a student T distribution. Um, <clears throat> then I can also define a trainer, uh, which is essentially uh, tells us how many epochs uh, to, to train uh, with which learning rate and uh, the batch size. And also this uh, funny uh, thing, the number of batches per epoch, um, mostly because uh, in the time series setting, I can keep sampling these random windows uh, kind of uh, more or less uh, um, as long as I want. So just to get some notion of uh, an epoch, uh, we also need to specify how many um, batches correspond to an epoch. Okay. Once I define my uh, model, I can just train it with the training data set and also give it uh, some number of workers uh, for, for the data loader here. And that will uh, go ahead and train such a model uh, and return a predictor, uh, a single global model. Uh, with the prediction in hand, we can now uh, predict the last window of the data, uh, the test data. Uh, and uh, Gluon actually comes with a nice um, helper uh, that uh, takes in the predictor as well as the test data set. And now uh, we also give it uh, the number of samples because it's a probabilistic forecast. We will sample um, sample values from this forecast given the, the next uh, time state uh, uh, many times, uh, in this case, 100 times. And from those 100 kind of um, uh, trajectories into the future, we can then uh, calculate uh, um, uh, we can then calculate our uh, uh, metrics in some sense. And also our, uh, uh, we can also empirically calculate the uncertainties of the distribution, of the forecast. Uh, a good example of this is uh, in our case here, where um, the forecast uh, um, is now not just a single value, but uh, kind of a distribution uh, that uh, we can uh, kind of calculate its uh, different intervals. Uh, probability intervals uh, into the future. And that kind of then quantifies the uncertainty of uh, the forecast of this model uh, into the future. Another very important uh, aspect of uh, the framework is to, uh, to, calcul to, do, uh, to calculate the metrics uh, with respect to the ground truth uh, test data. And that's done via the evaluator, uh, which then uh, outputs uh, aggregated metrics uh, as well as per time series metrics as well. And uh, uh, example of those ag aggregated metrics are uh, a lot of the time series metrics, uh, time series point forecasting metrics, as well as time series uh, distributional metrics as well. Um, so uh, the model also comes with uh, much more sophisticated, uh, uh, the framework comes with much more sophisticated models, in particular uh, the uh, uh, deep AR, which essentially uh, runs uh, RNN over uh, the, the 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 context and uh, context window, and at each point uh, outputs uh, the parameters of some chosen distribution, and uh, you minimize uh, you you maximize the log probability uh, of uh, that distribution with respect to the ground truth next time point. Uh, that's how you train it. And, and then at uh, inference time, uh, given this distribution, you can sample uh, the uh, value for the next time point and then autoregressively pass that back into the RNN to then get a, another sample of the, of the T plus one and T plus two uh, time steps into the future uh, till our desired uh, prediction. Then. And, and you can do that, you can do the sampling, as I said, uh, in the previous example, we did it 100 times. You can uh, do this uh, as many times as you want, and then again, get uh, uh, the quantiles and, and metrics and so forth, uh, which encode in some sense, the, the uncertainty of the forecast into the future. Uh, there's also other uh, models uh, incorporate, uh, implemented in, in the framework um, uh, based on, say, transformer uh, models, as well as a lot of multivariate uh, models, a multivariate version of uh, DPAR called DPAR or vector DPAR, uh, 
uh, there's a bunch of uh, uh, advanced probabilistic multivariate models uh, implemented as well. We have uh, also implemented um, a point forecasting uh, methods for uh, the multivariate problem, as well as uh, some newer um, univariate point forecasting methods like uh, NBEATS as well in the frame. So I wanted to end by talking about why we went through all the trouble of making this framework in PyTorch. And actually to begin with, the, uh, the, the main thing that was going for uh, PyTorch was that a lot of these distributions are already implemented and come with, with PyTorch. Uh, and um, other frameworks like MXNet or TensorFlow either don't provide distributions out of the box or implement them as kind of separate projects. Um, and the way the, the, this framework is structured, it's possible to use PyTorch uh, uh, data loaders, it's possible to use other more sophisticated uh, training and, and, and uh, uh, um, training utilities uh, like PyTorch Lightning or FastAI with it as well. So that was another um, reason to go with the PyTorch. Um, more importantly, from the research side, uh, it uh, because a lot of uh, research models are now come with PyTorch implementation, uh, we could integrate uh, those models quite easily uh, with the, this framework uh, for research purposes. And finally, uh, there's a number of other uh, PyTorch-based libraries which could be integrated uh, with uh, this framework uh, to create uh, more novel methods or use cases. Um, I, I mentioned Pyro. Uh, we can also look at uh, new neural ODE method, uh, methods for forecasting, and there's um, uh, frameworks there, uh, and um, you know other more sophisticated uh, kind of distribution uh, or generative modeling classes as well. <clears throat> right, so um, uh, so we went through all this trouble just uh, so we could have uh, a lot of those advantages as well. All right, so I'll stop here and um, be happy to take uh, questions that you may have uh, about PyTorch CS or, or, or anything else. Thank you, Kashif, for that wonderful presentation that was really no interesting about time series processing and modeling and using deep learning techniques. Right. Um, for those who are just joining us now, uh, we are speaking with Kashif Rasul, who um, is not only the co-creator of uh, Fashion MNIST, uh, but is also the developer of uh, the creator of PyTorch TS, a probabilistic framework for time series forecasting. Um, we are taking questions. Kashif is here to answer your queries about uh, using deep learning methods to forecast on time series. Uh, so please uh, put in your questions in the chat. And while we're waiting for um, our audience to chime in, um, mm -hmm. Jessica, do you want to get started? I know you had some questions for Kashif. Yeah, so this is definitely a very interesting topic because, at least personally, I don't know too much about um, the applications of time series modeling. But uh, given that you're at Zalando, um, and I'm assuming it's used to help uh, predict fashion trends, um, given that Zalando is a fashion company, um, so has it been has it been used in say like sub anticipating supply chain needs? Um, like anticipating what's popular next season. Uh, can you kind of talk a little bit more about how it's used? Uh, that's all right. Um, yeah, so one of the big use cases as you can imagine is to predict the, the sales of articles uh, into the future for any e-commerce company, not just uh, uh, Zalando. Um, and uh, so there, um, those predictions of sales are then used for, um, for um, planning for uh, putting discounts on, on articles and so forth. Um, again, it's also been uh, used, uh, deep learning based models at Zalando have been also used um, uh, for um, uh, planning, uh, you know, uh, for managing the logistics of articles, uh, managing um, um, the how much content in uh, the, the warehouse, uh, and, uh, how much uh, the warehouse is well supplied in terms of, um, you know, satisfying the customer's needs and and, um, and also for uh, uh, measuring um, ad 
uh, ad revenues and, 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 and those teams are also uh, heavy users of uh, time series forecasts. Um, I guess uh, you would need to you would need to define what a fashion trend is in terms of some numerical value. Then perhaps I think uh, predicting fashion trend is much more, uh, 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 in some sense, an NLP type task rather than a, um, a, numer a, time, a pure time series forecasting task. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Like seeing. Yeah, like picking up words that have, have been trending um, as opposed to right. repetition. Right. That makes sense. What about, um, I see Jonas in, on our Facebook Live has asked, have, have you seen it apply perhaps to financial data? Financial I'm sure stock? he's being very tongue in cheek. That's a unicorn that, I, to my knowledge, no one has been able to crack. Oh, I see. <laughs> Uh, has been applied to financial stock data. Well, uh, I mean, you can try it. Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure if, uh, you know, uh, a model can do as only as well as uh, the data and, and, and the patterns it can find in it. Uh, if uh, there are so many external kind of factors that affect uh, uh, a stock price uh, at any, and, and you don't, and you don't, give that information to the model, uh, then it will have a very hard time finding any uh, any um, signal in that noise. Um, I'm sure uh, people have tried not uh, not not PyTorch ES, but other deep learning based models for those uh, kind of problems. Um, but I'm not aware of anyone using it, um, using this framework uh, in particular. <clears throat> I had a question about uh, this technique. Uh, this is something new to me, so this might be a pretty noob question. No, no. Uh, I have used uh, recurrent neural networks before right. and uh, transformers for specifically NLP. But right. since here we are talking about probabilistic, uh, or rather forecasting the probabilistic distribution, mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little a bit about the, the nuance over here? Um, right. How should, how should we be seeing this uh, as right. a problem? Typically, you 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 have two factors here. You need something that models the the temporal development of your signal, and you need something that models the distribution uh, part as well. So, in terms of the temporal development, um, you can use an RNN, and then its hidden state can be uh, can be used at each time point to uh, toward uh, towards a kind of a distributional head in some sense. And uh, you can replace that RNN with a, a, a attention module, just making sure it's uh, it's masked. Uh, because remember, in attention, each uh, each um, entity can can see everything else. Uh, whereas in the time series setting, uh, you don't want to peek ahead because that is the task, you know, to predict the next value. Right. Uh, so if you so you making sure uh, with attention that every that uh, you have a causal mask. Uh, you can then again output uh, uh, representation at each time, uh, representation at each time point, uh, which again goes into the distributional head as well. Mm. So uh, there's these two aspects: the temporal development and the distributional head, and you can kind of play around with the, the architectures of, of uh, on the bo on both sides. What, on what the distribution. That, I'm sorry. Please go on. On the distributional part. Remember, we need to uh, do uh, uh, maximize the log probability of certain distribution with respect to the the data. Right. And and when uh, when these distributions are, are simple, then it's uh, it's easy to do that. It's computationally easy to do that. When these uh, when the data becomes very high dimensional, like in the multivariate setting, uh, then calculating this log probability, say for a full multivariate uh, uh, distribution with the, the covariance matrix and so forth uh, becomes uh, um, computationally um, uh, intractable. Yeah, intractable. And so then people do different tricks there as well to, to make it more uh, computationally efficient. But yeah, so there are these two uh, aspects. Hmm. I think I think back testing is a very integral part uh, of uh, this approach right. just to preserve the causal causal integrity of the model? Uh, no, uh, to just make sure that it's kind of performing, because uh, to check the performance of a time series model, 
you know, you cannot, uh, it's kind of predicting the future. And so you cannot really do it uh, right. in the wild. So you pretend that uh, uh, you go back in time and you pretend a certain time window is the future. And with that, then uh, you can at least compare the performance of your model with respect to what happened in reality um, and get metrics and so forth uh, out. All these models also assume that the kind of the underlying distribution of those time series don't ha hasn't changed right. over time as well, and so uh, that's another problem. Just... Jessica, did you have a question about um, methods that we can use in time series to analyze the accuracy of predictions? Right. Well. I think mm. I talked about. Oh, well, he was mentioning. We were talking about. You were talking right. about. Yeah. So this is a, a kind of a pro issue in some sense. Uh, uh, we have in in the univariate setting, uh, in the point forecasting setting, you have some numbers. You can compare it to what happened, and uh, there are a bunch of metrics you can use to to do that. When the output is a distribution, uh, and it's a, it's a little bit more prog problematic to kind of figure out uh, um, whether uh, whether the this distribution is the same one from which the the actual ground truth data came from which is just a single a single kind of uh, realization of that uh, in, in in back testing and so again there's a num bunch of um, metrics there as well for the univariate uh, probabilistic forecasting setting in the multivariate one, then it uh, it's, uh, gets even more difficult uh, to figure out uh, whether uh, um, the output of your your model is uh, really performing well, and learning all the, the 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 relationships between the entities and so forth, um, um, and how one can measure it uh, in a way that can then be compared with other other methods is. Uh, is a little bit non-trivial. I see. Well, kind of adding on to what you've been talking about, um, what are kind of the next iterations that you would like to see of PyTorch TS? Um, like, what are things that are there parts that you're you're actively working on tweaking or would like to? Yeah. So, uh, the, I mean, uh, I used it for research, and it would it would be nice to 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 also uh, allow allow people to kind of uh, use it also in, in the in a production setting. I need to fix up a lot of the documentation. Uh, there's a steep learning curve in kind of using it in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, the data sets and all the the helper methods and so forth. Um, so the uh, documentation side uh, needs a lot of work. Uh, the the training the uh, my training loop uh, my training routine is uh, pretty uh, simple and and uh, it would be nice to kind of uh, have uh, have it a little bit more sophisticated with maybe um, early stopping and, and and those things kind of built in as well. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, yeah, uh, would be good to also incorporate uh, um, uh, models that uh, a spatial spatial temporal models where uh, you also not only have the values in a time series, but also a graph of the kind of the connectivity between different uh, um, between different entities in a time series. And so incorporating it with a graph neural network uh, library as well would be uh, useful as well. Um, nothing, nothing else comes to mind, but yeah, those, those kind of things. Well, for anyone listening, then, if, if they're interested, maybe uh, they can, yeah, for, fork your repo, play around with it. Uh, if they're interested, collab with you. So definitely awesome. check out PyTorch TS on GitHub out. Um, should we take a pivot over then to Fashion MNIST? Uh, thank All you right. so much. Jessica, okay. Thomas, Thomas has a question for us on the YouTube live. Uh, oh, yeah. Thanks, Thomas, for your question. Uh, he wonders if you tried to forecast any COVID cases. With right. Yes. Uh, we did. Yes, we did uh, do that for uh, for Germany. 
as well uh, also for uh, the warehouses and so forth. Uh, so um, uh, that was done in order to then, um, in order to then uh, figure out some of the kind of the planning uh, on the planning side uh, for those wa warehouse uh, warehouse um, managers in terms of uh, how much uh, people to ask and and uh, how much um, you know preparation they would need and, and so forth. Uh, using, uh, in some sense, um, data from data from uh, the different um, uh, counties in in uh, county level data, and and as well as uh, temperature, humidity, and other kind of covariates. Uh, here uh, again, um, the, also there are covariates that somehow uh, are not known in the future, uh, which is uh, uh, problematic for for uh, this kind of uh, setting. And so what can we do, what we did was to also use um, historical, uh, historical say temperatures for what the temperature would be say next week. Uh, because if we, if you model something condition on the temperature, then uh, we also need to know what, or you can also get a forecast of the temperature as well and use that. Um, but yeah, we did use, uh, we did use, uh, use it for uh, the COVID, um, Oh, Forecast. that's very interesting. Right. Yeah, especially with like the, the compounding variables you're mentioning. Um, so I know we're kind of getting close on time, so I definitely want to save some um, conversation for Fashion MNIST. Right. Uh, pivoted over there uh, for now, but if anyone has questions, um, continue to, yeah, please ask um, yes. for any of the topics. Uh, so yeah, maybe you can give us some some background, um, some, some backstory of you know, what, what inspired it, and then how, how do you guys set it up? Did was it were there just like people manually annotating all the articles of clothing? Um, actually, maybe start off with some some background as to what it is. Right, um, I think. How it became. Yeah, so so fashionableness is a kind of a, a data set of um, uh, Zalando articles of ten in in ten categories, uh, in in some sense, in the format of the MNIST data set, which is twenty eight by twenty eight pixels, uh, grayscale pixel. Uh, images that kind of fits in into a very tiny uh, kind of um, um, data set that can be downloaded and 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 tried out uh, quite relatively fast. The origins of it were Han was uh, uh, the the creator, uh, the main creator was uh, um, tasked with looking at uh, investigating generative models, and uh, in order to um, uh, to experiment uh, uh, relatively quickly and iterate um, the, the, some of the next bigger data sets like CIFAR and so forth are a little bit uh, kind of uh, bigger and, and more uh, take more time. Uh, whereas uh, things uh, with MNIST uh, are that it's a relatively kind of easy for deep learning models to kind of uh, uh, become very, to, to kind of uh, to um, uh, it's a, it's a relatively easier problem with the handwritten digits and so forth. So there wasn't uh, anything. Uh, so he uh, started to um, um, notice that uh, you know Zalando has all this uh, data set, which are uh, ho image data, which are kind of annotated. Uh, uh, and you're right, they're annotated uh, in this pipeline, which kind of takes uh, images and and. Uh, annotates them all done by human but but once it's in the database then we can just use it and get uh, you know categories of clothing shoes and so forth and uh, so he made the kind of a binary version of, of that uh, data set uh, in order to play around with it at the same time i was also teaching a course on deep learning and people are also asking me about uh, knowing that zalando has a lot of data about uh, data sets they could use for learning as well, and so it, those kind of two things kind of came about at the same time, and so um, uh, we uh, um, we did it, and uh, we made this data set, uh, and um, uh, got approval also from Zalando legal team. It, it, they were all okay with it as well, and uh, so we released it. Uh, uh, mostly, he then uh, also released it with a whole bunch of benchmarks as well. Um, um, running uh, uh, as, as a kind of a, in a format where you can just replace the MNIST uh, kind of data set uh, uh, just with the, this other file and then everything else uh, is the same. So if you have a model that was running or using MNIST, 
uh, it was uh, that simple to just switch it to a uh, fashion MNIST. <clears throat> so that's the story. Uh, uh, then I worked with all the kind of the frameworks to add uh, data, uh, uh, data these, uh, to add fashion MNIST as another data set, in particular with Keras, with PyTorch, uh, with, uh, with the MXNet and, uh, and so forth. And uh, so once that was done, then it became even easier for people to, uh, to, to use this data set as well. Um, uh -huh. That's that's a piece of history right here. The fashion right. is such a <laughs> such an ubiquitous data set. I think even the PyTorch tutorial uses that, and right. just about any demo that you see on the internet. So uh, nice, right? Um, um, Fresh of you mentioned that uh, there are some improvements that you would like to see to PyTorch TS. I'm wondering right. if um, you would like to, um, you know, solicit any contributions from the community. Um, what kind of contributions are you looking for? And if they do want to uh, work on the project, um, how should mm -hmm. they be reaching out to you? Right. So everything's on GitHub, uh, on Git, on um, as an under research GitHub uh, organization. Um, typically, uh, uh, people create issues or or, pu or pu pull requests or fixes or. Uh, to the existing models, uh, as well as uh, um, bug fixes and, and so forth. Um, and so that's the easiest way is uh, through GitHub uh, to, uh, to reach out and uh, if, if that's possible. Yeah, folks who are interested, uh, the GitHub repo link is scrolling on your stream right now. Make right. sure you check it out and um, definitely hit up Kashif if you uh, have something to contribute to the project. Awesome. I see a question here. Can we forecast a target variable using multivariate time series with the uh, PyTorch teams? Uh, target Hi, can we forecast a target variable using multivariate time series? Um, what is PyTorch TS? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe watch this video again. Uh, anyway, we've, uh, can we forecast a target variable? Uh, are you saying, uh, so it's, uh, I don't really understand the question whether, um, uh, but essentially with a multivariate uh, time series, uh, uh, using multivariate time series uh, model, you, you don't forecast a, a variable, but the whole vector. Well, at, you, you forecast the distribution of the whole vector in uh, in the future for the future, and so you can sample from it and and get a, a realization of that vector, uh, but uh, rather than a variable. I, I maybe that was the question. Well, yes, yeah, uh, awesome. any question? Yeah, please, please add that. But um, so how about one one question that we like to ask all our guests? Uh, just kind mm -hmm. of a general question uh, to wrap things up. Um, yeah, what are you most excited about in PyTorch? Um, and then also, what are you most excited about in the AIML space? Um, in PyTorch, what am I most excited about? Um, at the moment, uh, I was, um, yeah, uh, at the moment I was uh, looking at uh, PyTorch uh, mobile. And, and kind of the applications of uh, of having models on uh, devices. Um, I don't see a, a kind of PyTorch light yet, uh, which is would which would also be uh, pretty awesome uh, to to be able to deploy um, PyTorch models on um, on uh, say um, um, very tiny uh, edge edge devices. Um, but uh, the whole, uh, the whole, that whole space is uh, relatively exciting uh, to me. Um, PyTorch 1.9 came out. I, I have to look at some of the, the features. Yeah, I was uh, about to that say that you should, you should definitely take a look at 1.9. I think you will find something right. um, along the same lines as right. you spoke of. Right. Uh, so probably, yeah, there are people working on that. So that's uh, that would be super exciting. And in terms of PyTorch, yeah, 
uh, TS uh, to be able to then deploy uh, models uh, like time series models uh, on, on devices would be exciting. I don't have models for anomaly detection either, which is another use case, I suppose, um, uh, very much related to the time series forecasting use case uh, yet. Uh, so working, working on that. I think um, other scientific uh, disciplines can also kind of use some of these models, in particular physicists, chemists, um, biologists. They also deal quite a lot with the time series models. And uh, I'm excited to see if uh, that community of scientists uh, also picks up uh, deep learning techniques and so forth uh, and, uh, and for their work. The, the COVID forecasting uh, work also kind of, uh, I worked with, uh, with, um, um, with a scientist who, 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 who's tasked with the, with, uh, with doing that. And so he was also excited with, uh, with the use of um, deep learning in, in, in this field rather than some of the more classical methods. Um, so that would be also exciting, I suppose. Uh, to incorporate uh, then, uh, you know, multimodal uh, forecast would, is another exciting area where, uh, you know, you, you, you incorporate a time series forecast with maybe image data or, or textual data and how, how that would work uh, it would also be. Exciting. Yeah, that's a pretty interesting space for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess. That's always a curveball like question. Like everyone always has to think a little hard about that. And, right. But uh, right. Thank, thanks for your answer and your insights, Kashif. Um, no worries. And your presentation was very helpful <clears> and <throat> just getting a sense of uh, what to expect in time series. Like right. earlier as well, when we were speaking, you mentioned that uh, time series is not spoken about enough. And right. today we made one move uh, to correct that. <laughs> so right. thank you for um, no uh, giving us your time. Kasha. No, no worries. Thank you for reaching out. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you to the listeners for their questions as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you're, if you're you. watching. Yeah, make sure to to keep posted. Uh, again, this is a weekly webinar, so yeah, like, subscribe, and then keep keep posted for for next week's series. And thank you again, Kasha. Uh, no, no worries. All right, that, yeah. call it a night. All right, bye Have everyone. Have a nice day. Ciao.